so I will tell you a bit about how we can use um, click chemistry to uh, label proteins in living cells. Uh, but before I start, I guess I would just um, like to go back to the basics. So why do we actually need to label cells? And I guess most of you sitting in this module um, are um, interested in this question or you already know. Um, and basically, if you look at um, unlabeled cells uh, under a light microscope, they don't provide us enough details. So this is, of course, very useful if we are checking our cells in the cell culture to look at their morphology, let's say to look at their differentiation status. Uh, but of course, if you want to do some more molecular studies, um, you would like to be able to see um, internal organization of the cells. And this is why we introduce uh, labels. And fluorescent labels are, of course, very useful as a contrast introducing method because they really allow us to highlight different parts of the cells. But basically, how can we label uh, cell components with fluorescent dyes? Um, so you can really use different cellular stains to label, let's say, different organelles um, inside the cell. And most of these are commercially available and I hope this works and it's not annoying for you because I hear myself. Um, so you can use, like these companies also now offer different um, simulators online where you can go uh, and you can select the structure. For example, mitochondria, you can select the color, let's say green, and then you will see uh, which products are available and if they can be used for live or fixed cell labeling. And you can even get a preview of how um, these cells will look when you label them um, with these dyes. And as already mentioned, you will also here be able to make some of these dyes uh, which can be used to target mitochondria, which I think is really cool. Um, but how can we label proteins? Let's say you are interested in a specific protein in a cell. Uh, so how do we do that? And I guess you also realized until now that we have kind of two options because uh, speakers were talking either about fluorescent proteins or organic dyes. And just very briefly, how do these methods work? Um, so the most widely used method, I guess, is to take your protein of interest and make a fusion with the fluorescent protein. And this works wonderfully in many cases and has many advantages, uh, such as that this is genetically encodable, which means you can express these fusions in living cells. You can then do live cell imaging. It's relatively easy to do. And um, these fluorescent proteins cover the whole spectrum and can be used for different types of microscopy. But of course, like every labeling method, they are also not perfect. And these fluorescent protein fusions can affect the function of your protein of interest. Um, and this, of course, is not the same for every protein. But let's say if you're interested in some ion channels or receptors, there is a risk that by fusing something like this, which is rel can be relatively large, can affect the function of your protein. And also, if we compare just their photophysical properties, um, we can find dyes which have better photophysical properties compared to uh, fluorescent proteins. But here the challenge is how to attach fluorescent dyes, how to attach these small fluorescent dyes uh, to our protein of interest. And also here we have several methods. So um, depending actually if you're doing live cell or fixed cell labeling, um, you, you have to choose, but basically um, you can use immunofluorescence with antibodies or nanobodies to bring the uh, fluorophores to your target proteins. You can use different uh, type of tags, which we also heard about uh, already during the meeting, such as SNAP, CLIP, and HALO tag. You can also use enzyme-mediated tags, like a sortase tag. Um, and all of these, again, have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, but what most of them have in common is that they are also relatively large. And actually, some of these tags are even larger than uh, GFP. And as such, they can also be fused uh, mainly only to the N or C termini. And that's why we have this interest and need in developing minimally invasive um, small labeling tags, basically to replace something like this with something as small as it can get. And if we look at proteins, um, these minimal tags are actually based on the building, building blocks of proteins, um, which are individual amino acids. And this has advantage because the probability is much lower that you will affect the function of your protein of interest. But also if we just look at the 
from the microscopist point of view, this has the advantage that uh, this will bring the fluorophore as close as possible to your target protein. Because I think what is really important to highlight is that whatever you image under the microscope is the fluorophore. So, you know, your target protein can be whatever, but what you're visualizing is the fluorophore. And depending on the labeling strategy that you're using, this fluorophore will always be put at a certain distance from your target protein. And here is just an example with the primary antibody, but if we put a secondary antibody, this distance becomes even uh, larger. And again, this is not a problem for conventional microscopy because the resolution is not high enough uh, to pick up um, this so-called linkage error, uh, but with the super resolution um, techniques, uh, of course, this becomes very relevant. And that's why these minimal tags um, are very important. And this is also discussed in the recent paper from last year from Stefan Hell's group, uh, where they also discuss um, and introduce some of these minimal labeling tags, uh, which are, of course, very relevant, especially when combined with um, minflux. Uh, but basically, how does this work? Um, so what do we need to get this labeling? Uh, so it is actually a two-step process where you first have to introduce these so-called unnatural amino acids um, into your proteins. And this can be done in vitro and in vivo um, by this so-called genetic code expansion. And then in the second step, you are using this click chemistry, which are basically reactions that allow you to bring uh, two building blocks um, very quickly together and selectively. And these um, click chemistry reactions actually won the Nobel Prize in chemistry last year. And they were actually not developed with an idea of using them for fluorescent protein labeling, but exactly for you know combining different um, building blocks together. And they are um, in the meantime, not used only for protein labeling, but also for um, labeling other type of bi biomolecules, because they really have this advantage that um, you can now combine these um, small um, uh, groups um, together. And when it comes to proteins, because we are using amino acids, we can put these anywhere in your, our protein of interest, and basically we can now get um, site-specific uh, labeling. Um, so basically, there are you know, it's a two-step two, two process, so there are at least two questions that we have to address. Uh, so how do we incorporate them and how do we label them? Um, and I will just briefly, because I've heard that we have here a mixed um, audience, so I apologize, this will be very basic for some of you. Uh, but basically, just as a brief reminder that um, proteins are made of um, am amino acids. So there are 20 canonical amino acids that building blocks and we also have selenocysteine and some organisms are using pyrolysin so basically 22 amino acids which are present in the nature and uh, the information for, uh, in our genes so DNA needs to be translated uh, into the amino acid sequence um, inside the proteins and this is done in a way that you first have your gene or DNA you have a transcription from this information into the messenger RNA and then the information from the messenger RNA gets translated into um, uh, proteins. And for this to happen, uh, very important is this genetic code, which is basically the set of rules that cell is using um, for protein synthesis. And this is something that is um, rather universal. So all forms, forms of life are using this same genetic code, which basically is telling you, um, so messenger RNA has these triplets of nucleotides, these so-called codons, and each codon is is representing one amino acid. And if you look at this table, you can find uh, basically um, which triplet corresponds to which um, amino acid. And for this to work, actually very important are these uh, transfer RNA molecules, which serve as adapter molecules, which will now carry the correct um, amino acid, basically uh, during the protein translation um, in the ribosome, uh, based on these codons on the uh, messenger RNA. What is also important here is that these tRNAs do not work alone. So they need um, enzymes. These are amino acid tRNA synthetases, uh, which are basically essential for cup coupling the correct amino acid to the correct um, tRNA. 
Um, so now we want to introduce something which we call unnatural, which uh, as such doesn't exist in nature. Um, so how do we do that? Uh, well, we kind of need to expand this genetic code, which means that we need to introduce additional components. So if we have now a natural amino acid, uh, we need to introduce um, uh, tRNA, which will be specific for it. We also need to um, assign one codon to the incorporation of the UAA. Uh, and we also need to have a tRNA synthetase, which will be specific for this um, unnatural amino acid. Um, so basically, where do we find these things? You might be wondering. Um, so first of all, where do we find these orthogonal tRNA and tRNA synthetase pairs? Well, usually we kind of borrow them from different um, organisms. Uh, and in this con uh, context, it's important um, to keep in mind the three domains of life. So it will not work if we take, for example, tRNA synthetase pairs from mouse and try to introduce them um, in human cells. But basically what you can take is certain pairs from archaea um, can be introduced in bacteria and eukaryotes. They will work there, but they will be orthogonal, which means that they will not interfere with any of the endogenous translational machinery. And similarly, you can take some uh, synthetase pairs, tRNA synthetase pairs from bacteria and introduce them in eukaryotes where they will also be orthogonal. And in addition to this, so very important, as I said, is that they are orthogonal, but also you need to make these uh, synthetases specific for the unnatural amino acid that you want to incorporate. Um, even more challenging in this whole um, process of labeling is how to find the unique codon. So I already told you, we have this table, there's like 64 codons. And if you look uh, carefully, yeah, um, kind of 61 of them are already taken because they are incorporating one of the canonical amino acids. Uh, but there are these three codons which say stop. Um, and normally these codons are used to signal uh, the, the ribosome, like this is where you should stop the translation of this protein. Um, and in that sense, they are unique because they are not encoding any of the canonical amino acid. And basically the trick in incorporating unnatural amino acids is to reassign one of these stop codons um, to, for the incorporation of the unnatural amino acids. And among these, um, this amber codon, so UAG is the most widely used, and that's why you might also hear about this method as amber codon suppression technology. Because then basically what happens if you want to incorporate these unnatural amino acids into your protein of interest is that you will first introduce this UAG codon at almost like any position in um, your gene of interest. You can do that by site-directed mutagenesis. And then if you provide the cells with this orthogonal tRNA synthetase and tRNA um, during the protein translation on the ribosome, you will have this pairing of the codons on the messenger RNAs, anticodons on the uh, transfer RNA, and you will have the genetic encoding of this unnatural amino acid anywhere you want uh, in your protein of interest. Um, of course, this is a bit more complex compared to, um, you know, if you just want to make a fluorescent protein fusion, uh, because yes, you need to bring all of these components inside the cell. Uh, but if we just speak about the method, how to bring them in, uh, I would say there is not too much reason to panic. I mean, there are maybe other reasons to be worried, but we can also discuss them. Uh, but when it comes, how do we bring these things inside the cells is by using plasmids. Um, so we have plasmids which encode uh, these tRNA and synthetase pairs. Then you will have your protein of interest with this site-specific mutation. And then depending on your model system, you can use transfections, viral vectors, electroporation, uh, basically uh, whatever you want. And this is what I mean, it's very similar uh, if you make a fluorescent protein fusion or a halo tags, you also need to usually bring them um, inside your uh, model system. And actually, this genetic code expansion, so the method of incorporating these unnatural amino acids in living cells is really not new. Um, so it's actually more than now 20 years old. And these were the first studies um, which were done uh, where the unnatural amino acids were incorporated in E. coli. Uh, very soon um, we had studies showing incorporation in eukaryotes, in yeast, uh, and actually just a few years later um, also incorporating unnatural amino acids um, even in primary neurons. And, um, but kind of what is 
um, important to realize is that we have really different classes of um, unnatural amino acids which can be used for different purposes. And at the same time when um, this was developed, also there was an interest in developing fluorescent unnatural amino acids, um, which of course could be very useful for fluorescent um, microscopy studies. And here are just some examples. And um, yeah, they can be used for um, different type of imaging and they also have um, their own advantages and disadvantages, but I guess the main disadvantage here is that uh, none of them have the most optimal photophysical properties which you would need for advanced microscopy. And something like um, Alexa dyes, which are um, used and very useful in our microscopy studies or sci 5 dyes or whatever, just imagine um, when you look at the structure of these fluorophores, they are too large to be incorporated in the form of a natural amino acid. Because what is important to understand that if you are incorporating these fluorophores as unnatural amino acids, they have to fit into the ribosome. And the larger they get, and they will get larger, the more complex the fluorophores are, they just cannot physically fit. And this is the reason why we have this two-step process where we are first incorporating uh, small so-called clickable unnatural amino acids. So they carry these clickable groups. Um, and then in the subsequent set, we are a step, we are actually adding a fluorophore. Um, and here, uh, it really depends on your application, uh, so what type of um, reaction you will use. But let's say if we are talking about live cell labeling, it's very important that these click reactions are fast, uh, specific, and not toxic for the cells. Because, yeah, after all, you don't want to kill your cells uh, by doing the labeling. And when we speak about uh, most commonly used click reactions, I guess the most famous example and was also mentioned here uh, during the meeting is this um, alkyne azide um, copper catalyzed click reaction. And this is like very fast, very specific reaction, reaction but of course one disadvantage is that it requires copper, uh, which can be toxic for the cells. But there are actually also some very recent studies um, which came out this year from Emmanuel um, where they managed also to optimize conditions for this copper catalyzed click labeling um, uh, with this picolyl azide and uh, PRF um, and they used it basically to look at the uh, conformational changes of um, glutamate receptors. So basically it really depends on your application and you can always find um, ways to overcome uh, some of the limitations. Um, but in my group, uh, we are particularly interested in these copper-free reactions because they are even less toxic for the cells. Um, and this was made possible by introducing these uh, strained compounds. So there is this ring with this alkyne here, which will react now with azide without copper um, in this type of azide ligation. And there are also reactions between strained alkenes, this double bond here, and tetrazines um, in this type of tetrazine ligation. And both both of these reactions proceed at physiological conditions, pH, without requirement for any um, catalyst, uh, but they differ in their speed. So this tetrazine ligation is much faster than the azide ligation. Um, and what is also good about these reactions, and I mean, I don't want to scare you with this chemistry, because I'm also not a chemist, but what I just want to tell you is what is good about these reactions is that um, they are also orthogonal to each other. So you can imagine an experiment where you have, let's say, one protein or two different proteins labeled with this alkyne and alkene UAA. And actually, um, these alkene UAAs will only react with tetrazines. Um, so you could use that to um, get one type of chemistry in. Uh, and then the alkyne UAA could also could be labeled with azide to get dual color labeling. And this is something that was first done in bacteria, uh, also more than 10 years ago, where two different populations of um, E. coli expressing uh, these two different chemistries um, were labeled now in this mutually orthogonal way. And at the same time, so in 2012, there were also first studies showing that this type of um, basically unnatural amino acids that you need for click uh, chemistry labeling can be incorporated in living mammalian cells. And this was done in parallel by Edward Lemke. So um, Edward was my postdoc supervisor, and this is actually when I joined his lab, um, and in parallel by uh, Jason Chin's lab. 
And basically, these are kind of proof of concept studies that uh, these amino acids can be incorporated and used for labeling in living cells. And when I joined the lab, we wanted to see, OK, can we use this for advanced microscopy in mammalian cells? Because most of these initial studies were done with some GFP reporter proteins showing that labeling is possible. And at that time, we were interested in an insulin receptor. And what we had to do is to mutate one of the positions uh, at the extracellular surface. So this lysine uh, was mutated. And you're really changing only one amino acid in your protein of interest. And then we were curious to see if we can now combine these two chemistries to so the tetrazine and azide ligation to also get dual color labeling in mammalian cells. And um, yes, we have tried this, but uh, it kind of was half successful. And I just want to show you here. So what was successful was this tetrazine ligation. So this is the surface of hex cells where they express insulin receptors uh, and this tetrazine ligation was uh, working. But the azide ligation with these similar conditions, like 10 minutes labeling at 37 degrees, gave us nothing. Um, and this was not surprising for us, because as I told you, this azide ligation is much slower. So we tried to kind of, um, yeah, optimize this. So we increased the concentration of the dye, but we also had had to wait two hours and you can see here that actually there was a lot of non-specific uh, labeling and endocytosis because when we uh, blocked the endocytosis we could get kind of more specific labeling which you can compare here by looking at the gfp and now the this azide uh, labeling but this is really not ideal for fast life cell labeling because you have to use very high concentrations of the dye and you wait two hours i mean this is definitely not fast um, so that's why, as I said, this was kind of half successful. And we were then, we also realized, and I think this is important for anyone who wants to use these techniques, that it really depends on your model system. So something that maybe worked in bacteria will, now, will not simply work in mammalian cells. And that's why it's very important to try different things. And then we were wondering, OK, can we find two fast orthogonal reactions um, by using these two different tetrazine chemistries, and I will also here cut a very long story uh, short, um, we basically managed to find two orthogonal uh, tetrazine ligations. And this is shown here. So this is the surface of a hex cell. We have now two populations of insulin receptors. Um, and here are the two chemistries um, that we use to label them. And at the same time, um, this was also the first demonstration that this type of chemistry can be used uh, for super resolution uh, microscopy, in this case, we did um, storm imaging. Um, so you might be wondering, OK, what about intracellular proteins? Because what I just showed you was extracellular labeling. Um, and as such, the method really can be adapted for any protein of interest, because all you have to do is transfect these components. And this can be a transmembrane protein, cytosolic protein, or let's say nuclear protein. But what I didn't tell you is uh, that it is much easier to do labeling of transmembrane proteins uh, because for this to work, if you label something which is exposed on the extracellular side, you um, actually just need cell impermeable dyes. And most of the dyes that we have or that we had uh, were cell impermeable because, you know, at some point chemists stopped making new dyes and only now with the developments of new techniques, we also have interest um, in uh, making new dyes and making more cell permeable dyes. Uh, and this is really one of the main challenges when it comes to this type of labeling, or was, uh, because the number of dyes uh, was very limited. And because if you want to do uh, labeling uh, of intracellular targets, you need cell permeable dyes. Um, and this was made possible first by the development of silicon rhodamine, uh, which uh, has very good properties also for um, uh, super resolution microscopy. And this was also the dye that was then used uh, to show um, also um, intracellular labeling uh, with um, click chemistry. But when we tried to use this um, type of um, chemistry and this fluorophore for intracellular labeling, we noticed something which was non-specific, and this is this um, nuclear background. So independently of where our target protein was, we saw signal in the nucleus. And this made us um, question, OK, why is this happening? And again, I will cut the long story short. But basically, what was happening is that 
this machinery that we need to incorporate a natural amino acids. So this is this um, amino acid tRNA synthetase and tRNA pair was for some reason mislocalized inside the nuclei. And this is what you can see here, a nuclear stain. Then we have immunofluorescence for this uh, synthetase, which is an enzyme. And we have a fish uh, against the tRNA itself. And you can see that both of these are stuck in the nuclei. And of course, this is surprising because um, if you think about it, uh, protein translation is happening in the cytoplasm, and these things really shouldn't go to the nucleus. Um, so we were wondering, okay, why? And can we somehow fix this? Um, and that is why we fused them to this nuclear export signal, uh, which helped us, first of all, to bring these components now outside of this um, nucleus. So in the cytosol, you can now see that both the synthetase and the tRNA were present in the cytosol. Uh, but what basically this had as a consequence was also that we managed to increase the yield uh, of the incorporation of um, unnatural amino acids. Um, and also in this study, um, by increasing the yield, we also combine this uh, type of labeling with uh, site-specific um, click paint um, super resolution imaging. And basically, this is one approach, how you can increase uh, a bit the yield of the incorporation of the UAAs. There are also other methods uh, which um, use different strategies. Uh, so again, because this um, involves modifying how cells synthesize proteins, you can use these engineered uh, release factors to increase the yield of uh, UAA incorporation. You can also use different designer tRNAs, so basically there are different strategies. And again, depending on your application, you would have to find um, and test what is best for your system. Uh, so in my group, we are actually interested in um, neurobiology and different uh, neuronal proteins. Um, and as I already mentioned, I think in general, these proteins happen to be sensitive to uh, conventional modifications. Uh, and also some of the um, studies after this type of labeling was developed also showed uh, labeling of neuronal proteins, but in standard cell lines uh, where you know, different uh, receptors, um, or in this case, um, uh, amyloid beta protein were labeled with um, click chemistry. And when I started my group, I was very interested in, okay, can we actually bring this into neurons? Um, you know, can we make them express these components and uh, label um, proteins with uh, click chemistry? Um, primary neurons are a bit more complex than uh, conventional cell lines. So um, yeah, this took us a bit of time to optimize. But basically then um, in 2021, so my group um, published a preprint about this and also Marcus Zauer and Daniel Choquet, um, they also published their preprint in which um, we both show that this click chemistry can be used for labeling of uh, proteins in primary neurons. Um, and Papers happen to be kind of a bit complementary because we were mainly focusing on intracellular click labeling and stat microscopy, uh, while um, Marcus and Daniel were um, doing extracellular labeling and uh, D-storm microscopy. Um, so just very briefly, what we did is that we, were, we are interested in neurofilaments. Uh, so neurofilaments are cytoskeletal proteins, so intermediate filaments, uh, which are specific for neuronal cells. Um, they are um, actually very, um, what shall I say, they have a very small diameter, so below the resolution limit. Um, they form heteropolymers, and we are particularly interested in this neurofilament light chain because this is also evolving as a biomarker for many diseases, but at the basic cell biology level, we still do not fully understand what is happening with these proteins during injury. Um, and this is something that we are also studying in my group, and we have one project where we had problems with conventional labeling, which motivated us um, to actually actually develop um, click chemistry based labeling for a uh, neurofilament light chain. Um, and this was a project that Alexandra, a PhD student in the lab, was working on. And I will just now show you some of the applications, but very briefly what you can do uh, basically with this type of labeling in um, neurons. Uh, so in this case, what we did was uh, that after transfections, and uh, we would do click labeling in living cells. Um, and after this click labeling, we first fix our neurons and then took them to the microscope. Uh, and these were the first examples with this silicon rhodamine tetrazine um, that we can actually get a specific labeling and enough signal to noise uh, ratio to actually detect them. But 
excuse me. But what I was telling you is that the advantage of this labeling is that you can do it in living cells. So you might be wondering, OK, can we also do live cell imaging? And this is also what we did. Um, and here you can see these neurofilaments labeled with silicon rhodamine tetrazine in, um, um, in living neurons. Um, as a next step, we wanted to see, OK, if the signal to noise is high enough to get super resolution imaging. And because we use silicon rhodamine tetrazine, um, which works um, relatively well with STAT microscopy, uh, this is what we tried first. So you can see here an overview of a neuron expressing neurofilaments with confocal microscopy. Then if you zoom in, um, you can see here some of these neurofilament networks. And if you compare confocal and STAT deconvolved, you can see here also so with these line profiles um, that we get also increase in the resolution. Um, but what I find powerful about this type of labeling is that you can also do different type of pulse chase studies. So for example, it is possible to do um, first click reaction in your uh, living neurons, then do some kind of stimulus, or in our case, it's an injury, then do this second type of reaction, and then you can either fix your cells and look at them live under the microscope. And as I mentioned, this is something that in my group we are interested in uh, by doing um, oxidative stress injury, where we can now look at different populations of neurofilaments which were synthesized before and after injury, and here is just combined um, with the STAT microscopy where we had have healthy and um, injured neurons. Um, what we also try to do, which would of course be even more powerful, is to avoid using transfections, so overexpression, but to try to actually label these proteins at the endogenous level by um, using the um, uh, genome editing. This we also tried, but um, this is a bit more challenging to do. So this is just an example of a, a wild type um, neurofilament labeling that, that it works. Uh, and then to get the site specific labeling or click chemistry labeling, we actually um, had to use a trick and introduce a small type of tag um, in order to not interfere with the expression levels of these neurofilaments in living cells. But if you're interested, I'm um, really happy to discuss this with you further. So in addition to these neurofilaments, which are um, cytoskeletal proteins, we were also working on labeling um, different transmembrane proteins. And we are particularly interested in these voltage-gated sodium channels. Uh, so they are expressed at exon initial segments and nodes of Ramier. Um, and they are actually rather large. So this is um, a protein which has more than 2,000 amino acids. And it's actually just expressing this inside cells and inside neurons is challenging on its own. And even finding um, permissive sites for the incorporation of the amino acids is not easy because there are many mutations associated, uh, for example, with epilepsy, um, which are um, happening in this protein. And this is a project that Nevena, a PhD student in the lab, was working on. Um, and um, we have also managed to find several variants which we can use for click labeling. Uh, we also did electrophysiological characterization of these variants to make sure that the function is not affected. Uh, we then managed to do the click labeling. And here you can see exon initial segment. And we also did conventional and um, super resolution microscopy of these click labeled uh, voltage gated uh, sodium channels in the exon initial segment. But to make this possible, we had to further improve the method by, again, increasing the efficiency of the incorporation of the unnatural amino acids. And we did that uh, by developing um, viral vectors. And in this case, we used um, AAVs to get uh, higher e efficiency. Um, and with this, I would just like to briefly summarize. So. Um, what are the advantages of this labeling in case you are considering uh, using it in your lab? Of course, um, it has its disadvantages also. But if you are looking for a label which will give you minimal perturbations to your protein, uh, this might be worth considering because indeed, kind of it still cannot get smaller than this uh, because you are changing only one amino acid in your protein. Um, it is also site specific. So there is hope that for any protein that you're interested in, you will be able to find uh, permissive sites which will not affect the function of your protein. Um, also, what is good about it is that once you have established it, um, it's kind of modular. So you can easily change the fluorophore that you're using for click labeling. Because again, depending on the type of microscopy that you're using, you cannot use same fluorophores, let's say, for storm instead microscopy. And this is why 
I think, you know, once it's established, it's not so difficult um, to change and just swap the fluorophore. Um, also, this type of labeling is very versatile. And by versatile, I mean that I was mainly telling you about uh, clicking dyes or clicking fluorophores for um, microscopy. But you can also think of clicking many other type of probes. Um, and I think this really um, has many applications. And also, even beyond these clickable unnatural amino acids, there are many other um, categories of unnatural amino acids, also, for example, used for optogenetic. Uh, which can be of interest in other type of uh, microscopy studies. Um, and with this, um, I would like to thank um, my lab, um, so my team in Tübingen, also Edward's lab, where I did my postdoc and where I actually entered this field, um, our funding, um, of course, you um, for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. I also have some slides where I'm more kind of going in how to um, set this up and what are some of the limitations, but maybe I will wait for your questions and we can then um, discuss these. Thank you for the nice talk. So what happens to the endogenous protein carrying the AMBAR stop? Exactly, so that is one of the, the, the challenges of the method uh, because Yes, this requires um, engineering these um, amber codons at the desired position in your gene of interest. But of course, endogenous genes will also have, to a certain extent, amber codon. And historically, amber codon was chosen because it's the most, uh, like, it's the least used. So in bacteria, it's only 8% of genes. So they thought, okay, let's take this one. In eukaryotes, of course, it's more. It's like 20% of the genes. So, of course, there is a risk that um, you will also have misincorporation of the unnatural amino acids at these endogenous amber codons. What the studies seem to suggest is that, so first of all, it's not enough um, for the incorporation of the UAA to happen to have the amber codon because the real stop codon also has all the other sequences. So it's more likely that actually translation will stop then that you will have misincorporation because we are constantly actually fighting with the low efficiency and you know with the cells even wanting to ignore these stop codons and to get truncated proteins so the probability is not high and some studies have shown that if this happens that you get these elongated endogenous proteins that they get degraded i mean of course this can still have some consequences on the cell but it's also not something that we see as such visible problem when we do microscopy but of course this is one of the limitations and that's why you know some other methods are exploring using so-called quadruplet codons so to really get away of the top codons there are also ways to design um, um, organelles for orthogonal uh, translation so i think the field is also developing in the direction of um, getting away from using amber codons Uh, very nice talk. So, uh, have you tried uh, click reaction after fix, uh, fixation of the cells? Yes, so we, we can also do that. So, there is no limitation. You can do both. Um, for some reason, I mean, I guess um, it's just because the cells, it's actually, it seems to be better if we do click labeling during uh, when cells are still alive. So we seem to have less background, but this will, of course, also depend on the fluorophore. Also, for some of our experiments, we had cell impermeable fluorophores that we had to then add to the cells after fixation. And of course, then you could play with different washing protocols and probably find a way to reduce the background. But it seems that if you have good cell permeable fluorophore, that the labeling background will be lower if you do the whole procedure in living cells. But again, it will depend on your protein of interest, but it's definitely worth testing different conditions for different purposes. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. As far as I remember, this uh, strain alkene, DBCO, they're also a little bit reactive towards thiols. I don't know if. You yeah, you know this. Yes. Have you noticed a kind of problem in this way? Uh, I mean, I th we haven't noticed s problems, like in terms of, I think you have to choose, okay, what is the most bioorthogonal, but I guess you will not have a perfect uh, solution. But we haven't noticed, like, 
any problems, let's say, when we do this type of labeling, or even if you try to do it in vitro, but I think it's, of course, important also to, to keep that in mind. I mean, there is also an additional problem if you use these um, transcyclooctenes. Um, depending on which one you use and the tetrazine ligation, there can also come, uh, the cleavage can happen. And I think this is more important uh, to then really choose wisely components that you need um, for the click reaction. Maybe I, I have one. Uh, I was wondering, uh, uh, in your own, because they are, they are very fragile, so it's, it's really impressive what, what you did. Uh, I was wondering, uh, do you have an idea of the, of the time that the, the probe can be stable or not, and if there is interaction with a, a lysosome for degradation or this kind of stuff? Yes, so we, we have tried, like in most of our experiments, I think we kind of are in the range of days. So we do our transfections or transactions, and then we wait two or three days for neurons to make enough of our protein, and then we do click labeling. And usually after the click labeling, we image them rather fast, unless we are doing these pulse chase experiments. And what we have noticed is that actually unnatural amino acids alone, even without the machinery, like to go to lysosomes mm -hmm. where you can then have some non-specific labeling once you add the fluorophores. But this is really, it seems to really be the consequence of the unnatural amino acid being present. Okay. And one would have to probably try to reduce the concentration. And we have also noticed that different unnatural amino acids neurons don't tolerate in the same way, which we don't fully understand. But with some of them, we couldn't keep them for three days. Um, they would just die after two days. And with some, we could keep them longer. And this is something that we don't fully understand. Maybe it's also just the purity, even though they are both commercially available. But definitely, it's important also to keep that in mind, because neurons are a bit more fragile. Yeah, they're a bit hard to, to yes. work with. <laughs> yeah. 